In this video, I want to talk about the TCR and the BCR. So we want to clarify how do adaptive immune cells see antigen? So first of all, they are antigen specific. So each T or B cell recognizes only one unique antigen. And that's obviously in huge contrast to the toll-like receptors or these pattern recognition receptors that we discussed for the innate immune cells because they recognize broad classes of pathogen, not one unique antigen. And another very important characteristic is that their TCRs and BCRs are made by gene recombination. So gene recombination within the TCR and BCR genes during T cell development generates this random antigen specificity that will be unique for every T or B cell. So very importantly, this TCR and BCR gene is not encoded completely in the genome. And why is that? Because we have only 20,000 genes. But we have 100,000 different TCRs and BCRs. So how would that work? That can't work. Because even if we say immunologists are the most important people, they should have all the genes for themselves. So the max, if we would use up all our genes for TCRs and BCRs, we would have 20,000 TCRs or BCRs, but we have 100,000. And honestly, we are not that important. So we need other genes as well. So we cannot use up everything by TCRs and BCR genes. So Mother Nature has developed this fantastic method of a cut and paste strategy to use just a couple of genes. And by random cutting and pasting them along, you get this huge diversity of T and B cell receptor. And that is done by gene recombination, and we're going to discuss this in a couple of minutes more in detail. Another characteristic that is important to know is that all TCRs or BCRs on one cell are specific for the same antigen. So they all have, every cell has multiple copies of the same TCR on its surface. So they all recognize the same antigen on one cell. So these are the most important general characteristics for the BCR and TCR. So let's just summarize again. So number one, it's specificity. So they all recognize just an unique antigen. So these are not classes of pathogen that are recognized. It's one unique antigen, just a couple of amino acids. Then the second characteristic is they have huge diversity. We have 100,000 different TCRs and BCRs. And then the last characteristic is clonality. So all the TCRs on one cell are the same. And those are all characteristics that are very different from the innate immune system. So they are not specific, they don't have diversity, and there's no clonality. And just as a quick reminder, we talked about clonality before. So remember we said when there are these naive T cells, and what I've drawn here are CD4 T cells, are sitting in the lymph node and are waiting to become activated. And one of them is going to be the lucky guy, because this dendritic cell here is going to activate the CD4 T cell because the peptide MHC complex matches with the T cell receptor. And then this T cell undergoes proliferation and differentiation into an effector T cell. And in the case of a CD4 T cell, it would be a T helper cell. But now importantly, this specific T helper cell clone has now all the same T cell receptor. So that's clonality because it comes from this original naive T cell, and it makes a clone of effector cells. So you can think about this like Xerox copies. It just makes Xerox copies of a single cell. 
That's clonality. Let's go more in detail and start talking about the B cell receptor first, and then we're going to do the T cell receptor. So we're going to first look at its structure. So the B cell receptor is really nothing else than a membrane stuck anti antibody. So if you normally think about that's kind of this Y shaped molecule that looks like an antibody, well, then you just add this two feet there and then you have a BCR. So BCRs, let's write this also down, are cell surface antibodies. And they contain two identical heavy chains and two light chains. So you can clearly here see the heavy chain and then the light chain, which is just a shorter one, so therefore light. And then we can split up the heavy chain and the light chain into a variable region and a constant region. And so you can see here that each, the light and the heavy chains, have a variable and a constant region. I abbreviated this with V for variable region and a C for constant region. Let's write this also down and add some more details. So the heavy chain is made out of a constant region and there are actually five different isotypes. So again, isotypes are genes that have a very similar function, but are not identical. And there are five different isotypes for the heavy chain, mu, delta, gamma, alpha, and epsilon. And again, these are the isotypes. And then we have a variable region. And also the light chain is made out of a constant region. Here we have two isotypes, that's delta and kappa, and then we have a variable region. And before we get to the next point, here you can just see in this nomenclature box, again, what we just discussed, so we have we can think about an antibody consisting out of a heavy chain and a light chain, but we can also further split up the heavy chain into the constant and the variable regions. Same for the light chain. The next characteristic that I want to discuss is the antigen binding site. And it turns out that the combined N termini of the heavy and the light chain form the antigen binding site. So I'm going to show you this antigen binding site here. That's kind of the site that recognizes the antigen. And again, you can clearly see it's made out of heavy and light chain. And it lies within the variable region. And that's also makes sense from the wording because we said the adaptive immune system is a part of the system that can adapt to any possible invader. And so it needs to have a lot of variability and diversity in order to recognize anything. And it recognizes it with its variable region. And also, if you wonder, N termini just means the start of the protein and the C terminus is the end of the protein. And in the case of the BCR, the C termini stuck into the membrane. So let's write this also down. The C termini of the heavy chains at the base of the BCR are embedded in the cell membrane. Now what you can clearly see that the feet of this antibodies are very short. So you can guess that signaling cannot happen with the feet of the antibody. They're just too short because we eventually need to reach with signaling cascades in nucleus and we're just not going to get down there. So it turns out that there is a signaling domain that the BCR uses. So it doesn't use its own feet, just in, it recognizes the antigen via the antigen binding site. And then this BCR gets activated, but actually the signaling happens via another molecule. It's an associated molecule. It's an alpha beta heterodimer. So let's write this also down. Signaling occurs via associated alpha beta heterodimer. So it's just this alpha chain and a beta chain and it forms a dimer. And because it's not the same, it's not two alpha chains, it's an alpha and a beta, we call it a heterodimer. 
And also this is going to come up again. I just want to mention it now and I will mention this more often, but it's a very important concept to understand that one single antigen will not get a signaling cascade activated. So you need always a multitude of antigens that bind to several BCRs in order to get BCR cross-linking. So this BCR receptors cross-link and that initiates the signaling cascade. And that means that molecules, proteins that activate BCRs always need to have some motifs that are repetitive. Because remember, the B cell expresses the same BCR all over in this one single cell. So it needs to be recognized by several BCRs in order to activate the B cell and to initiate the signaling cascade via this alpha beta heterodimer. Let's talk next what the BCR recognizes. Remember what I said before that the T cell is our arrogant cell. The T cell only takes peptide and it needs to be presented in a very specific way via MHC molecules. In contrast, the B cell is our humble cell. It takes everything. So it recognizes a wide variety of molecules. It could be intact proteins, amino acids, sugar, nucleic acids, small organic molecules. So we have a much wider variety. That's also very important because we want to make antibodies against a lot of different things. We don't want to be limited to just peptides. Now, what is the ideal B cell antigen? So how does an effective B cell antigen look like? And that's very important and it's going to come up in your vaccine lecture as well, because when we want to develop vaccines, we want to develop them against antigen that make us the best antibodies. And obviously that was a major thought over the last year. How can we make good vaccines? How can we get a good antibody response? So first of all, it needs to be an extracellular macromolecule. And that should make sense because antibodies, they detect extracellular stuff. They cannot get inside a cell. And then antigens need to be in their original confirmation. And that's very important because the B cell epitopes are often portions of macromolecules and the folding of the macromolecules often creates epitopes to which the B cell receptor then reacts. So this original confirmation, this 3D structure matters. And that's also in big contrast to the T cell because remember, the T cell reacts against peptides and they have already been digested. They end up in the endosome and then they're going to be loaded onto MHC. There's no original 3D structure left anymore. And then also the epitope must be on the surface of a macromolecule. And that should also make sense because if it's not on the surface, the BCR cannot recognize it. The BCR doesn't get into cells. Let's talk next about the T cell receptor. And you can see here its structure. So there are a lot of similarities, but also some differences that we're going to figure out. The TCR is also a cell surface protein that consists out of an alpha and a beta chain. And there are some similarities in gene structure with the heavy and light chain. And on purpose, I did the similarities kind of in the same color, so the blue and the teal. That should remind you about the heavy chain and the light chain. And very similar to the BCR, the combined N termini of the TCR alpha and beta chain create the single antigen binding site at the tip of the TCR. And again, we have the C termini that are stuck into the membrane. So the combined C termini are embedded in the cell membrane. And also very similar to the BCR, the feet, so the C termini that are stuck into the membrane are too short to initiate signaling. So we need another signaling complex. And this signaling complex for the T cell has its own name. So there is a signaling complex called CD3. So each TCR is accompanied 
by a protein complex called CD3, and the signaling occurs via CD3. Now you can also appreciate why we used the CD3 before as a labeling molecule, because every T cell has it. And just as a quick mnemonic, how to remember all these numbers, let's go back to our original site where we had all this identification tag. So you can see CD3 is on every T cell, and then we have two flavors, CD4 or CD8. So these are rather the tiny numbers, so T for tiny. And the B cells, B for big, they have rather than big numbers, CD19 and CD20. That's all I wanted to say about CD3. And now I just want to mention again in terms of the nomenclature. So I already said we have alpha and a beta, we have an alpha and a beta domain, so a heterodimer. And also we can split them up into the variable region and the constant region. And you can see this here again, that's a variable region and that's a constant region. So it's very similar to the BCR where the recognition side is again made up by the variable region. Let's talk next about the recognition via the TCR. So what does the TCR recognize? First of all, and I've mentioned it already a lot of times, but I will mention it again, all TCRs must bind to an antigen peptide MHC complex on the surface of another cell. So what is here the important part? Well, it cannot recognize peptide just thrown on it. It always needs to be in the context of MHC. So the T cell is not going to talk to you as long as it doesn't see MHC. So very important. And then the other point is it recognizes peptide. And this peptide comes from a digested protein. And so the T cells only recognize peptide in the context of a specific MHC. And it should also make sense why it's a digested protein, because remember, in order to show up on MHC, you're going to be first digested. Because if you show up on MHC1, well, then this protein has been chopped up by the proteasome. It's been taken up by TAP. So it cannot be in its original conformation. And then if it's going to be taken up from the outside, it's endocytose or it's phagocytose. It's ending up in the endosome or phagosome. There's acid. There are enzymes. So it's never going to be in its original conformation. And again, the T cells only recognize peptide in the context of a specific MHC. This concludes the video on the structure of the T and the B cell receptor.